Almost a century ago, President Roosevelt's New Deal helped lift the US out of the Great Depression. Today, there's talk of a Green New Deal to combat climate change, and the EU has just launched its own version. So what does the European Union need to do to be carbon neutral in just 30 years? Welcome to Roundtable. And a warm welcome to the programme from me, David Foster. The US and the EU plans envisage an economic revolution to fight the climate crisis. But in the EU, not every country is convinced. In December, the European Union unveiled its Green New Deal to combat climate change. Its goal is to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by cutting carbon emissions to zero by 2050. At the moment, energy production and transport accounts for 75% and 25% of greenhouse gas emissions in Europe, respectively. So the EU plans to spend more than $100 billion in green technologies like solar, wind and hydroelectric power. There are also plans for greener forms of transport. But environmental groups say the carbon neutrality targets fall well below what's needed to tackle the global climate emergency. And not all the EU members are convinced about the terms of the deal. Poland, for instance, has already refused to commit. So how achievable is Europe's Green Deal? And is it too little, too late? Time to say hello to our guests in Brussels, Colin Roche, the Climate Justice Coordinator for Friends of the Earth Europe. We cross to Montreal, Canada, VJ Colin Givadi, a development expert there who says we need to decolonize green deals. With me at the round table is Elizabeth Robinson, Professor of Environmental Economics at Reading University and Rashid Nix from the UK's Green Party. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, climate Justice, Colin, does this represent that? Um, no, it doesn't. Unfortunately, while it's, it's heavy on rhetoric and it, it promises uh, a lot, ultimately it fails the test of whether or not it's delivering Europe's fair share in its action to deal with the climate tr crisis. Um, we're faced with a climate emergency. Uh, the European Union has recognised that. It recognises that we need to go to carbon neutral. But what it doesn't do is take enough action here in the European Union, one of the largest polluters in the world, one of the richest regions in the world, and one of those most responsible for the climate crisis. It fails to take sufficient action to bring us out of the climate crisis and to deal with the European Union's own responsibility for creating the crisis that we're in. OK, we've got a little couple of pages here from the EU saying, what is the European Green Deal? The EU will become climate neutral by 2050, protect human life, animals and plants. It's our new growth strategy. It will help us cut emissions while creating jobs, help ensure a just and inclusive transition. Um, better than nothing, though? Um, it, it's a step forward in the rhetoric. It, it challenges the, the... It mentions growth, um, with recognising that growth is an issue, but it fails to come up with a new paradigm for how we will deliver an economy in the, in the midst mm. of a climate emergency. So window dressing? Um, sorry? Is it just window dressing? Um, hopefully it will go beyond window dressing. It will move us some small steps forward, but fundamentally it's not taking the action that is sufficient. So, for example, carbon neutral by 2050 sounds very good, but in fact it's not enough to deliver Europe's fair share of its responsibility. Okay. We need to be moving much faster than 2050. And, what, and not only that, we need to be moving forward now. Um, we need to be taking big, bold strides right. now. And we only really have a decade to take the big shifts that we need to take in order to avoid a climate uh, crisis. And Colin, I'm going to put that to Rashid because I know you think now is almost too late. It needs to be tomorrow, if not by the end of this week, rather than 2050. But Elizabeth, let me put this to you. 30 years to do all of these changes, $100 billion. I mean, that isn't really a very long time, is it? Uh, it, it, it depends what we're looking at. So to some extent, we need to look at the kind of investments we're making now and the kind of investments we've made already. So on the one hand, I, I 
I appreciate this idea that the faster we move, the better. But what we do need to do is keep populations on board and move as fast as possible as we can, keeping populations on board. And what we know at the moment is more than half the population in most countries in the EU actually want governments to take action about climate change. So that's a good thing. We also know that there are actions that need to be taken today, and you're exactly right. We don't need to start making new investments in coal, in fossil fuels. And there are other actions that are going to be harder. It's particularly hard, for example, to decarbonize uh, cement and some of the heavy industries. So there are actions that need to be taken now, and there are actions that maybe will take a little bit longer. And it's, it, it's a tough one. I think I would like to see the more rapidly we can decarbonize the better, but we've got to be realistic as well. You see, you, see, you said roughly half the EU's population want their governments to do something about this, which presupposes that roughly half doesn't. More than half do. More than half do. It, okay, it, so, one so sees in the, a large Yeah, a large, large proportion do. So the, the support is there. Yes. <sighs> To, well, because they're extent, worried about their jobs, they're worried about the taxes that might have to go up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For sure, and I think to some extent it's how we sell it. So I think, for example, uh, we've talked a lot about Poland, I think, as being one of those countries where it's particularly dependent on coal. So there's 100,000 jobs in Poland mm. directly dependent on coal. There's over 40,000 deaths a year in Poland due to air pollution. So we have to start looking at the, the status quo and you know where the political will is to actually have a change. And so I think it's... It's sometimes easy to sort of think of the status quo and think, well, this is, this is my lifestyle, I'm comfortable with it. So we do need to create new normals. Whether it's possible, that's what we're talking about. And mm. um, I know you would rather things happened right now, Rashid, but when mm -hmm. you saw this, what did you think? Um, well, there's, there's, the, there's the, uh, the cynical part of me which just sees it as window dressing, political posturing. But then there's the optimistic part of me that says, well, finally, it's on the agenda. Finally, it's being put to the front of the political agenda and it's been, you know, it's been raised in the highest circles. So, so we have to, you know, take the rough with the smooth, as we say. You know, when there's a humanitarian disaster, an awful lot of countries come together and pledge all sorts of vast sums of money. And then when you come to collect it at the end of the day, you found that an awful lot of it were just promises. Yes. Um, and not an awful lot of money action has actually happened. Is that what is your biggest concern? Is that, yes, fine words, but... I would have to agree with the uh, professor in terms of, you know does the political will actually exist to deliver on these promises? Mm. And I think sometimes, you know, we, we can see the political will quickly, you know, be mobilised. If, if there's, you know, an invasion to happen in, a, in, in, in the Middle East, we can mobilise the political will and can make things happen very quickly. But when it comes down to, uh, you know, to the environment and where we live, then there's a lot of uh, foot dragging happening. OK, let's, well, there's an awful lot to talk about, but I want to bring Vijay in. Vijay Kolonjivadi, uh, you wrote this article in which you talked about decolonization for a Green Deal to work. I I've read it twice and I, I pretty much get what you're saying, but I don't understand why that fits into this argument. Well, tell us what it's about anyway. Well, I, I think, um, I think uh, what some of the other speakers have already said are, are very interesting, but I think what we need is a strong structurally transformative change, both culturally and economically. The EU's proposal for a Green New Deal is a great effort. It's, it's, it's uh, substantially needed at this moment, but at this stage, and given the urgency of changes that we require, it's simply not enough. We need, we, it, it will be window dressing unless we address inequality, unless we address systemic and systematic uh, inequalities on racialized, gendered, and... But you uh, see, the trouble is that's been around for hundreds, thousands of years, and you're not going to change it. Rashid wants things to change tomorrow. You're not going to change that in 30 years, are you? No, we won't change it in 30 years, but we need to be in a state of, 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 of almost warlike mobilization right now. We've, hear, we've heard several scientists, um, climate scientists at the UN who have been increasingly urging and, and providing very, very uh, starking, stark information about what is happening right now. And I mean, we're seeing Australia burning. This is unprecedented. You know, these kinds of changes cannot wait for next election cycles. They cannot wait for political posturing. They cannot wait and they simply cannot, cannot uh, you know, depend on the existing priorities where, that we have. But you're right you're now. talking we about a restructuring of the world's social systems and economies, not specifically about the Green Deal. When it comes to um, the European Green Deal and, and by extension, the US one as, as well. What action do you think should be taken 
to address the the tomorrow problem. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to break it down into green new and deal and just focus on what a decolonial green new deal would look like. A green a decolonial green deal would be about seeing the environment as sets of relations. It would not treat the environment as an object. So we need to transform the way we're even thinking about the environment here, the way we're even talking about, you know, climate change as itself, as a technical managerial problem. The second point, new. What is so new about this green, about a Green New Deal if it is still, you know, if it's not addressing, for example, it's, it's not Stopping fossil fuel extraction. There is nothing in the EU Green New Deal that says that fossil fuel extraction must end. Why is that not there? That's a, that's another question. Why are we continuing to treat uh, human bodies and natures as resources and cheap lab- labor for yeah. economic production? And finally, deal. What a deal on whose terms? I would like to say. What uh, you know? Where are we? Um, you know? What kinds of ways of being are being marginalized and, and silenced. We need to be able to call up those voices and have them be heard in global decision yeah. making. Uh, Elizabeth, I want to come to you about the economics of, of this in just a moment. But uh, Colin, you, you were nodding in agreement with some of what um, VJ yes. was saying. Specifically, what? Yeah. So if you look at one example of of the contradiction that's in, here in European Union policy is that while we talk about being carbon neutral and while the Green New Deal says we must end fossil fuel subsidies, the European Union today is continuing to fund gas pipelines, for example, which will last well beyond 2050. And so we see lots of rhetoric, but when it comes down to the hard energy policy that we need to change, uh, it's business as usual. It's the same supporting fossil fuels. um, It's the same energy system. um, And we're, we're not really building into our energy planning a new a new energy system. We're not building in today the type of economy that we need to have after 2050. Um, and we will never achieve a real Green New Deal unless we fundamentally rethink the economy and rethink Europe's energy system. Okay, because Elizabeth, let's talk about the economics of this. I noticed that you said that this is simply some countries will be exporting their emissions. In other words, it's smoke and mirrors. You can say all the finest things and say, look, we're not mm-hmm. polluting because we've actually yeah. got somebody else to do it for us. So, so one of the reasons why the UK has been able to um, reduce its emissions quite rapidly is because we, we've sort of we've stopped manufacturing. So a lot of our manufacturing has been exported to other countries. So if we look at what we consume in, in, in the UK, our emissions would look very different from what we actually produce. Uh, so, so, so when we look at the economics, uh, the EU has already talked about having some sort of adjustment at the border. It's basically a tax. And you have some uh, adjustment at the border of the EU that takes into account um, if we're importing uh, products from other countries which don't have such strict... Which are heavy polluters themselves. Well, well they don't have such <laughs> strict... It's not the extent to which they're heavy polluters, but how the manufacturing process okay. is for that particular good. Uh, but well, one thing we can do immediately, so uh, I, I don't think I disagree with Colin or Vijay too much, but if we talk about practical steps that we can do immediately, for example, a carbon tax. So it's not just a matter of reducing subsidies. It, it, it's kind of crazy if you think about it. We're subsidising environmental bads. We're subsidising things that harm the planet and we're subsidising things that harm our health. For example, fossil fuels and and coal. So what we really need to do is put a tax on goods that reflect the bad they do. Then we need to think about a a just a a, a just transition. So what we know is that if we stopped if we stopped mining coal today, there'd be an awful lot of cold people in Poland, right? Because that's what they heat their houses with. So then we've got to start thinking about as we phase out coal, we need to phase in insulating homes. We need to phase in and all of which is is going to cost money. Subsidy this, subsidise this, subsidise that, and that means higher taxes and higher taxes inevitably are going to hurt the less well-off in society more than the well-off. It's just not fair. You know, if if we're looking for certain standards of living, if we want certain services delivered, we have to pay for it, and it's it's called taxation. It's, It's happened and it will continue to happen. If we were to put the taxation at a rate where the super wealthy and the corporations who avoid paying billions of pounds every year in taxes actually pay their fair share, we wouldn't even have this conversation. Okay, so that goes back to some of what Vijay is saying, is that we actually Absolutely. need to change the social system and the tax burden needs to fall it's, more it's, greatly. It's, it's got to be a structural on, adjustment. Yeah? Yeah. All right. And what about jobs that might be lost, Colin? Do you think that's likely, or will jobs be created as the EU promises? Well, one thing we know, for example, is that we need to reshape the economy. We also need to rebuild uh, Europe um, in order to deliver a, an energy-efficient Europe, and one that has less energy demand. 
And so for do, by doing that, I think we can use the investment fund that the European Union is now talking about uh, to increase our investment in making those warm homes in Poland and right across the European Union. So there's, there's plenty of opportunities in, in the European Green Deal, but also in the transition that we need to make. And so what we need to be doing is fundamentally shifting the, the money in the economy away from the bads, as it were, uh, and towards the goods. So stop the fossil fuel subsidies, stop mm. spending money on new gas pipelines and start spending it on warm homes and making sure that people have the energy they need to run their households. OK, Vijay, I'll come to you in just a moment, but Rashid, I, I want to come back to yeah. you because rather than just discussing whether tax is a good thing or a bad thing, I would like to ask you how we will know whether this is working or not. How will we know whether well, the Green New Deal is European working? European Green Deal. Well, number one, I think the quality of people's lives will improve. And how will we measure that? In London, 9,500 people die every year because of poor air quality. This is London alone. Uh, the professor mentioned in Poland, you said, how many? Was it 40,000? 40,000 die. So, so th this, is, this is stuff that you can actually measure. You know, I think if, if, we, if we measure the quality of human life about, you know, based around the amount of stuff that we can consume, how much do we earn? And we, and we use all these, you know, these really old basic measurements of GDP, then I think we're in trouble. We need to start shifting how we actually look at, you know, the way we measure this stuff. And I think quality of life and how people actually interact with each other. I think the, one of the problems with this is that because we live in such a consumer-based culture, we're, we're talking about a, a complete culture shift. And I don't know whether or not people actually want to shift their behaviour patterns. Vijay, drivers have changed the Green parties ac across the world. Is that something to be very pleased about? I think the advancements uh, that have been made by the Green Party um, in different places around the world is is definitely something um, to be, uh, I mean, it's definitely an improvement. We're seeing greater consciousness of uh, the environmental crises we're facing and how they're linked to social issues. And this is definitely something that, mm. um, you know, is, is a positive sign. However, the, the question that, that I have and in relation to inequality, which we're talking about, is... How can we hold governments accountable to their to those who prop them up financially? So those who are supporting governments, you know, there are bigger interests that we are, you know, we're not we're not seeing the nexus. And that nexus, if we cannot hold government accountable to the inequalities and we're promoting uh, policies or holding back, let's say, from policies in order to satisfy those who finance who are financing us, and we're, I'm talking about in all all walks yeah. of life here. Well, let, let's throw this and one. Let's throw this one to Colin because what that um, presupposes, um, to some extent, is that business perhaps would be against this sort of change. But business is surely coming to realise that it has to change to fit in with the public mood, and perhaps because it has a, a little bit of a conscience when it comes to saving the planet. Well, we were certainly seeing the rhetoric from business tidying up. Um, and we're seeing a lot of talk about sustainability, as we have for decades. But really, for us, much of this, we're, what we're seeing is simply a change of tactics rather, rather than a change of the fundamentals. So sitting here in Brussels, we're surrounded every day by advertisements, by lobbying meetings, by the fossil fuel industry, uh, slowing down the process of change, continuing to put pebbles into the, into the gears of our transition. And so while they talk up a game, talk, talk a big game, what we're continuing to see is them dragging back action across the European Union. And so for us in, in Friends of the Earth Europe, we think we need to have a, now a fossil free politics. And we need to make a clear dividing line between our politics and the fossil fuel corporations who continue to get in the way of the just transition. Is that likely, Elizabeth? <laughs> Uh, we need government, strong government. So if we take an example of vehicles, OK, if we, look at, if we look at what's driving increased emissions in the world, and this really shocked me, number one, power, not surprisingly. Two, SUVs, right? Big cars, big gas-guzzling cars, mainly driven around in towns. And so what, why are car manufacturers, you know, so invested in SUVs? Well, they, there's high they profits associated. they can't stop there's, making them today. Well, just a minute. They, <laughs> There's, they, they, could, they could rapidly run down, but there's high profits associated with SUVs. There's a lot of advertising there. So, and, and people like them because they see the adverts and they see other people driving them and they feel safer in them rather than their little car. I'm not quite sure where you're going them. with this. You're saying okay. adverts should be banned, they should be made illegal? Absolutely not, what? absolutely not. So 
So individual car companies may not, in, on their own, change. But with strong government regulation, for example, about emissions per kilometre driven, this gives the incentives for cars to change. But already, forward-looking car manufacturers are saying, are talking about when they're going to phase out diesel or yeah. when they're going to phase out petrol because of government regulation. So you need a combination of strong government regulation and, and firms will then see, you know, what is in their interest with that. Well, uh, is that happening? To some extent but it needs to be done a little more rapidly. But we've also got to think about stranded assets. So, and that's why transitions matter. Help us with matter. that. OK, so if you I... You've got your money in something you can't do anything with. Really, doesn't absolutely. It? If, I, if, I, if I invest in a coal mine or if I start a coal mine today and then tomorrow I'm told you can't use that coal mine anymore, that's, that's a stranded asset. So that's why the transitions matter. But it's, it's very hard to think that firms on their own are just going to change and behave the way we kind of want them to. It's sort of not human nature. And that's hard to believe sometimes because all business people, most business people have children or nephews or nieces. You know, we're all looking to the kind of, um, the, the world we're bequeathing to the next generation, to our kids. And knowing that though, even so, we will still probably fly, we will still probably drive. But if governments create environments in which it makes more sense to take public transport. Is that affordable? Yes, it is, but, but I, I'd go back to Rashid's Unav point. Unavoidable in terms of oh, what, what you, what you have to do. I don't know if you said to, affordable. To, no, I said affordable. Yeah. Is it affordable? I said, OK, it's unavoidable if you right. want to, to reverse what's happening. But can it be afforded? Yes, because it's just as Rashid said, we, we use taxes to provide public goods, to provide things that are good for society, right? And so I live in London, and public transport up to the 18, age of 18 is free for my girls. So they can use the bus for free up to the age of 18. That seems a no-brainer to me. But it's not there in other cities. I just read that Germany is reducing the cost of long-distance train travel to incentivize people to travel by train. Now, when I look at my yes. lifestyle and what would make me more prosperous, yes. okay, it's walking without polluted air to the tube. It's my daughters walking home at night knowing they're safe. It's not me having a fancier car or a bigger car. It's my daughters being independent and safe and with public transport that's reliable and frequent. So we've got to start think, rethinking what it means to be a prosperous society, mm. what we want to bequeath to our children. And when you say, is it affordable? If we all sit back and do nothing, we are going to destroy the planet. You know, is that affordable? This is just the wrong way to think about it. We need to do the right thing. And if we do the right thing, investing in in these public goods, investing in infrastructure, in public transport, yeah. in clean energy, the society will be better off and it'll be more equitable. OK, industry, mobility, you've talked about mobility, renovating buildings, we talked about perhaps doing that in Poland, um, reducing, um, making Europe carbon neutral within 30 years. Um, are we trying to save the planet for the next generation or the generation after that, or is it too late? You know, there's the, uh, there's the really cynical side of me that just sees this as being a, a political game that's being played out in real time before our eyes. And there's the optimistic side of me that thinks, you know, finally we've woken up and we've realised there are going to be generations to come and we have to maintain the planet in, a, in, a, in, a, in an order which we can be proud to pass on to. Colin, where does the pressure need to be applied? Well, it's been very encouraging this year seeing the the people on the streets across Europe, um, the climate strikes, um, Greta Thunberg and millions of others joining that effort. Um, and I think that the European Green Deal itself is a result of that pressure. Um, it's, an, it's an expression by the political system uh, responding to that. So we need to see more of that. Um, more people on the streets, more people calling out their politicians for action. And I think only then when we get, will we get sufficient pressure to move the political system to deliver a real transition. OK, Vijay, I'd just ask you to try and wrap this one up a little bit with a, with a more international uh, look at things. There you are, just uh, north of the US border. You're, you're in Canada. Um, we have the, the new Green Deal over there. In Europe, we have the European Green Deal. Knowing the president of the United States and knowing the mood in Europe, which of the two deals do you think is most likely to be successful? Well, it's positive to see the substantial amount of resources that are invested in in the Green New Deal, the European Green New Deal at $100 billion. That's, that's, uh, that's very, very, as I mentioned, very substantial. But we have to, just going back to the question of inequality, um, we cannot do a comparative analysis of the Green New Deal in 
U.S. or in North America with the Green New Deal in Europe. We need to. I suppose what I'm trying to, trying to say is, you you, you need the political will, you need the the world mood to be different. And if you have a president like Donald Trump who won't even sign up to to climate accords, is it at all possible that the the new Green Deal will will take off in the U.S.? So let me just just say that in in just in 2019 alone, in 20, this came from Bloomberg itself. In 2019, the 500 most wealthiest uh, people on earth have gained a collective amount of 1.2 trillion dollars. This is just in 2019 alone. So we're just talking. Where are our priorities lying? You know, this is this is this is where are we actually? How are we treating the future of humanity? You know, how are we treat, treating the future of the, where the climate burden is going to? And, and there, uh, there, lie. Vijay, I have to stop you. Um, the one word you said towards the end that I can pull back to the studio and deliver to the audience is the future. That is what we've been talking about. Uh, however you want to change it, Vijay, thank you very much indeed. Colin, appreciate your time. Rashid and Elizabeth, thank you very much for coming in. It is the future. 2050 is the date. I doubt I'll be sitting in this chair in 30 years' time. Perhaps somebody who follows me will and will be able to say whether it's worked or it hasn't. From me, David Foster, goodbye for now.